Um, so one class SVM is one of the last uh, classic uh, anomaly detection algorithms. Um, and you know SVM already, we talked about that last week. Um, and so one class SVM is just um, applying SVM for, uh, for anomaly detection. So um, right, remember the idea with SVM is that you've got some data points that are displayed somehow, and then I'm sure this is a plot on the thing later anyways, um, and you're trying to uh, find a line that goes between them and divides them, right? And you're gonna have uh, support factors that you're, um, that you're using to, uh, to anchor this, but um, you're trying to fit this line so that minimizes um, the margin. Uh, basically, you want to maximize as much space um, between these data points as you can, right? And um, if they're not linearly separable, you can kind of replace it with a, a kernel mapping that basically can create curves through space that are quite uh, flexible. But you have to know how to what mapping you're going to choose to move the data from this space to some other different number of dimensions where you can have a straight plane in that dimension. Um, so for anomaly detection, um, this would work as long as you knew that all your data was of one type or another, right? Um, so this um, one class SVM uses the idea of like a one versus all way of doing anomaly detection. So if you have, um, you could have multiple classes of real data, um, but you're assuming that essentially there's two classes of data, there's normal and abnormal um, data. Right, and so the ones that are abnormal are the ones going to be in the class you're trying to learn, um, and uh, well, the ones that are normal, the ones in the class you're going to learn usually, and then anything outside that class would be an anomaly, right? So everything that applies for SVMs can be used here. The addition that they use for this is they have a new parameter, um, new, which uh, looks like a V, but in in Greek it's the letter nu, uh, so in, in LaTeX it's uh, slash nu, um, but it looks like a, an italic v. Um, and essentially use this instead of um, the c that we had in the original um, SVM def definition. So what this turns out to be is a different formulation of SVM where you have this parameter that you have to tune as your input, and it's um, essentially an estimate of um, the number of outliers that you're going to have in the um, number of outliers you're going to detect and basically claim are in the data, um, but it's also a uh, lower bound on number of uh, support factors. So if you set new to some number, then you basically are insisting to the algorithm that it must have at least that many support factors. So if it's five, then it's going to try and use five points as its anchors and have five of the alphas not be zero in the optimization. Um, but it will also try to limit itself to like um, five uh, points being outliers. Now it might not get that exactly, but that's what it's going to aim in the optimization because that's what V ends up being. So V kind of defines this frontier of what um, normal points and abnormal points are. Um, so we'll show some uh, some data on that in a moment. Okay. So this is the simple version of the looking at the formulas. Well, it's not going to say a simple version, but the original SVM we had, um, sometimes people use this. The font you use can kind of like look a little different. We had this initial ETA, I think. Is it ETA in LaTeX? Um, I don't use that one very much um, for this uh, Slack variable, right, which tells you um, how much error you're going to allow on each one of the, uh, the data points, so if they're overlapping into the... if they're overlapping into the um, margin, then you allow it. And in the original one, we have this parameter C, which says um, if you have C being high, then basically you're creating the penalty for, um, for being uh, over the margin is high, and so we'll try to minimize that. So we'll try to find a line such that and a margin such that um, none of the data points are within the margin, so the support factors will be outside that. 
And if you let C be very low, then it won't really care about getting this wrong, and you can have points that are on the wrong side of the line, and it still gives you the line. Um, so it's this uh, variable. So in their um, new SVM uh, uh, formulation, um, which is useful for this one class and only detection, they replace C with this um, one over new L. And L, I think it's just the number of dimensions. Um, and new is just the, the number that we said, like how many support vectors you're gonna have, right? So it's actually a much more intuitive way of thinking of that optimization. Um, and you can use this for normal SVM and just say, how many support vectors do I want? I want it to be anchored onto, you know, five points. And so we'll set that to five. Um, and then this will kind of optimize that. And um, that's how they, they use it. Um, so um, the main idea then is like that, um, in this example case, uh, the regular observations are the purple points and um, yellow, oh sorry, white are the ones that they learned um, originally. So you trained it on, on the white points and purple points were other points from the same distribution, so they fit. And the yellow ones, um, these are yellow, these are purple, these are white, if you can't see the colors properly. Um, the yellow ones are noise or a completely abnormal outside from a different distribution. And so um, this new, um, you can't see blue on blue, this um, new, or it looks like V um, parameter adjusts um, where this line is going to be, right? And it says how many um, we want to have. And uh, I think their default on scikit-learn is 20, or even in the original paper is 20. So you said, V to 20, and that's kind of a good number often. But tuning that obviously is one of these things that's hard to set properly, so optimally. Um, but um, that's what it it does. Um, let's see what the original paper had anything else about that. So the paper on that one's kind of not so uh, complicated. It's a nice kind of approach to just looking at um, SVM in general and with this modification on how to how to use it. Um, oh, you can't see it now because we're on a different screen. Um, but that's the original paper. It should also be in the, um, the references for this week's slides. Um, still, I mean, a little bit old, 2000, they're updating that. Um, but it seems like a standard um, approach that people use. So when you look in S scikit-learn um, for um, SVM, which is kind of your summary of all the ways of doing it now that work, um, they've got um, the original version. Um, which is the, the SVC version, right? So that's how it's actually defined classically. And then they've got this new SVC version that uses that parameter instead, so you'd give it the V instead of the C. So that you, um, if you want to control how many points or outliers, it's interesting that the number of support vectors and the number of outliers are controlled by the same variable, that that's the one that makes sense. Um, so that's, uh, that's an interesting side effect of that thing. Okay, any questions on that? So that's this other class. Um, then we have some of these, oh, what is the one to zoom? Here we go. Um, now that we've learned how they work, we have those um, artificial data sets that we created for that paper, um, comparing the different ones. So I showed you the results from my Mondrian on these. This is showing the results of the other methods on them. Um, I don't know why those aren't circled at all. There should be some circles in the local outlier factor one. Um, right, and you can see um, something like Isolation Forest, it has a lot more ability to kind of, I guess, uh, find specific structure, whereas the SVM is, this would also be using an RBF kernel um, for SVM, I'm sure. So uh, it would be uh, limited to kind of circular um, patterns around the points. That's the kind of uh, structures it's going to learn, but it can have, have donuts and all that kind of thing. It's just that a, a decision tree has more ability to just do clean cuts, right? Um, but it's not necessarily better, right? That's why one class SVM is one that people would often use because it's, it's comparable in many cases. I guess 
yeah, maybe the coloring came from LOF um, in terms of what's anomaly and what isn't, because we're not putting the lines on that one, but that's very density based. So LOF is good at just like DB scan, right? It says if the points are dense, then it's in one class. If they're not, it's in another class. Um, and then these ones that are like based on k-means or PCA can be okay, but they can, really are assuming the data has a certain roundish uh, distribution, right? So um, they're going to be limited. Um, so yeah, that's the, the classic methods. And then I was just reading today, actually, because there's a talk um, this afternoon, which I, I mentioned to everyone at, at 1 o'clock. There's a talk on um, online um, from... Uh, a prof from Oregon State University, um, Tom Dietrich, who used to be head of AAAI and, and um, does a lot of things. I also did my postdoc with him, so he's really good in uh, machine learning, especially in decision making and um, Markov decision process and, so, and stuff, but also in, in anomaly detections. He has several papers on anomaly detection. Um, and this paper that I'm citing here, uh, and you'll see in the references at the end, is one they had from just it's on archive now, so it's not even published yet. And they were doing an overview of the latest stuff going on in anomaly detection. Um, and uh, kind of the stuff I'm talking about is more of these in this distance-based um, area. We said we can use um, k-means, and we talked about some of these PCA methods, and we talked about OCSVM. But apparently in the last, like, really just a couple of years, there's been an explosion in trying to apply anomaly detection using um, deep learning. Um, in uh, in different ways, because historically neural networks are not very useful for anomaly detection, right? A neural network, as we're gonna talk about next, um, learns a pattern. So you give it a pattern, it can recreate, recreate that pattern, and it's very good at learning arbitrary and complex patterns. But it's not good at finding things it's never seen before. In fact, neural networks are bad at you know, dealing with, with things they've never seen before. Um, so it seems like from some initial reading that I'm looking at from this paper um, that um, they take advantage of that, that people are basically find, have found ways more recently to say, we're gonna build a neural network that um, learns what's, what's normal, can generate new examples of that, and so when it sees something abnormal, it can use its surprise, in a sense, at how um, different that is. Um, to be an anomaly detector. And so that was the trick that people couldn't figure out, I guess, 10 years ago. Um, but in the last really couple of years, um, this explosion of new methods um, have basically started to deal with that. And we're gonna talk about what um, some of these methods are so that you could understand that. Um, variational autoencoders and um, um, generative models. Um, but this, there's lots to basically see there. Um, and so when they looked at it just recently, they were trying to classify, group together all the algorithms and different types of things. So ones that are basically classifiers like SVM that say, build a classifier. And if the classifier basically gives you a low probability for the new data point, then you say it's an anomaly. That's one way, a whole class of things. Or you could have an algorithm that basically builds a probabilistic model and then something that has a low probability data point um, is an anomaly. Or you can have something that's really good at generating new instances of data. So like the deep fakes things, you know, that you use on your phone to, to put your face on something else, someone else, right? So if you have a model that can generate new data quite realistically, then um, when you give it an anomaly, it'll say, that's not a good example of new data. I would not put that in the data set, right? And most of the ones we've been talking about actually are using inherent um, things of the data, um, distances and, and density. Um, but there's been kind of improvements since then. So um, that's kind of an overview of where those go. And so that latest paper was kind of a good thing to follow on for the next step of what people use for anomaly detection. Um, did it reset? Oh yeah, it didn't reset. So I will have to run my bib tech again. So when I post the um, slides up, the updated slides up uh, later today, uh, that reference will be in there because it's not in there right now. Um, good. Okay, so we have a question for one class SVM. We need labeled data, right? Um,
it's data that's normal. Well, um, you could do it with that way. So if you have labels, um, you're basically using a labeled data set uh, as the anchor, then um, you uh, you learn a, a good model of the the classes, and then um, if something deviates from that, you uh, you say it's an anomaly. I'm trying to think if it can be used as an unsupervised thing. Yeah, because I think it can also be used as unsupervised because you're basically saying um, try to fit, like you're saying there's only two classes and the, the parameter in new tells you how many outliers you want. So as long as you're, you have an idea of how many outliers there are and you set that parameter properly, it can say like build me a classifier such that um, there are only this many classifiers, right? So it optimizes the line so that it's got the number of classifiers, the percentage of classifiers that you said. Um, so in that way, you don't need labels at all. You just say, optimize the parameters of this so that all of the, the outliers are in the right range. Um, so you could use it either way. You could build it as a classifier where you're basically using the, um, the score on a, a newly, um, arrived point to say that it's it's a bad uh, it's a bad example of this class as the score or you could use this way where you're optimizing for the number of outliers but that means if your number of outliers is wrong then it's gonna give you an incorrect uh, model so good question <laughs>